class where we're going to start to talk about personal research practices and some of the approaches that have come about in the last few years to deal with some of the common problems. So I wanted to start off with this kind of funny comic um, where this was, uh, this is coming from a researcher who's an experimental psychologist at um, the University of Cambridge. And it sort of provides like a snapshot of the many different types of questionable research practices in the context of how sort of detrimental are any of these practices to a science this career. Uh, and so, you know, P hacking, as Dave mentioned, there's a really common practice, but, you know, it kind of lies um, towards the top of this diagram and then fraudulent data, um, imaging data and the like, which we haven't covered as much, um, sort of lies at the bottom. And, you know, that could obviously, you know, uh, have someone lose their tenure or um, be affected in a very drastic way. Um, so wanted to um, use that to sort of motivate um, sort of what's common and what's, and what's not common. So, you know, the literature, like, you know, like uh, just kind of surveying researchers, um, doing some, um, yeah, surveying researchers, getting a lot of uh, sort of metadata, uh, we can kind of sort of get at what are more common and, and, and uncommon research practices. So um, I sort of put them into three categories. Um, and so starting with the first category, um, we have fraud, which I just mentioned, um, and ob obvious reasons. There are a lot of perverse incentives. Um, sort of, you know, effectively, if you if you commit fraud, then you will, like I said, lose tenure. Um, so there's this other uh, set of practices. So file drawing, failed studies. So basically, you know, if my study wasn't significant, I'm choosing not to report it to anyone. Making statistical errors, not uh, not calculating, maybe like um, calculating p values incorrectly. Um, insufficient power, which we talked a bit about last class, uh, which is very common, I think, in the social sciences. Uh, and then the last category um, with the very common question research practices, uh, we have p-hacking, which is something that I really want to um, elaborate a bit more on today because it motivates the homework assignment. And so these, these, all these question research practices come, come from this paper, False Positive Psychology. I think it has about 6,000 citations. It's really popular, but it sort of was the first um, paper to kind of just uh, comprehensively survey uh, the many types of ways that researchers kind of abuse their degree of freedom. So, uh, right, so let's go to the, right, so what, are, what, what might be some ways to deal with some of these um, practices? So we described a few, so um, in fraud detection, it's, it's probably very difficult to deal with that because, you know, it, um, it, it doesn't kind of come out until later and, um, it, you know, it does require a sense of disclosure around the data and the materials. Um, and, but, you know, there are a number of researchers, research uh, articles that have been retracted over the years and there are some famous um, people in the news of uh, Dave uh, mentioned uh, who were retracted for kind of humorous reasons. Um, the second category, um, what can be done? Pre-registration and journal acceptance, which I'll, I'll, I'll in the journal acceptance around pre-registration, which I'll elaborate a bit on at this talk. Um, statistical checks of uh, making sure that you know you're you're not you know computing things incorrectly, doing <coughs> doing a proper power power analysis is another approach. Uh, and then for the last category of p-hacking, um, there's sort of these new. Um, uh, techniques coming out of uh, the psych community, the statistics, uh, statistics community, the economics community that uh, try to kind of, given that we understand that many researchers p-hack, how can we sort of look at a body of literature and quantify the extent of which uh, a finding might, a, a phenomenon might be p-hacked. So I'll describe a bit, um, a bit of those methods today. Um, and then also uh, pre-registration register reports, both in both two and three, these kind of do help um, deal with some of the problems um, that, you know, come from hypothesizing after the results are known um, and help, you know, bring about more transparency in what the researcher might have done. So, yeah. Um, great. So, uh, Dave had mentioned some, so I want to start off with this kind of the first category um, and some common ways to maybe, 
you know, be more, I guess, open about your, your research. Uh, and so we're starting off with kind of these resources that people and um, open scientists kind of tend to use uh, that are really common. So they're normally used to provide your data materials, but also to register your studies. Um, and so then we're going to get into um, some common databases to kind of find studies that have been retracted in the literature um, and, and, and sort of researchers that uh, commonly um, have been, you know, had many uh, findings retracted over time. Uh, and then another set of uh, databases that talk about or provide um, some um, large scale applications and sort of the entities that allow it to uh, occur. And then finally, uh, so some another website that sort of provides you with a way to get a sense of the commentary uh, on a particular article. Um, and so, yeah. So this is probably the most popular website, uh, you know, utilized in this uh, kind of community that's sort of emphasizing more transparency, less p hacking, called the Open Science Foundation. So really, it's kind of a way to, um, you know, pre-register your studies. Uh, there's a web, I mean, there's a, you know, a form that you can submit. There are many like templates that I'll describe a bit later that allow you to kind of sort of save yourself from someone expecting you that you, you've p-hacked. Uh, and they have sort of like, um, they have a set of integrations uh, that sort of allow people to upload data, uh, you know, up to 50 gigabytes or so of, of research materials uh, uh, that's, that's sort of publicly available. For everyone to see, and there are also these uh, cloud integrations that you can um, add in as well in order to um, basically put more data. But it sort of came out of this notion that hey, you know, we don't, we can't really characterize everything that someone's doing uh, just using these like post hoc tests. Um, can we just start to embrace transparency and make sure that everything is on the open so we can kind of come to that decision paper on a case by case sort of basis uh, with as much information as possible. And so here are some of the integrations that Open Science Framework has. Uh, like I said, uh, extension of Google Drive, um, you know, GitHub, Dropbox to allow you to add more, more data. Um, and you can kind of explore the website to maybe get a sense of some other aspects of the feature services that they have. So uh, David had mentioned this in the last class, basically retraction database is a great way of identifying, you know, whether a particular uh, field, subtopic, article, uh, author has uh, has had a paper that's been uh, retracted, or there's some um, reason behind that retraction, it's a great way to identify um, findings, which I uh, encourage you to explore this uh, at, your, at your own sort of like um, choosing. Uh, so this, um, so this other, uh, so now we're kind of going to replication. So this website basically has published some uh, reversals in psychology. So at the end of the class, we're gonna talk about some common findings that we now no longer feel that we have um, faith in and trust in. So uh, this is an like open source uh, a group of people, framework for open research reproducible. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's essentially kind of a, uh, it's old acronym is like, I think I believe like open <laughs> resources, sorry, open reproducibility research transparency um yeah I, I i i know it but i just right now um you can choose to like look at that yourself but essentially they try to provide um, educational materials but also reversals that are common um there's also data repl replicata so they have been uh they have a blog that basically lists out some uh, replications um they're like i mentioned last class there are these large uh large uh entities of many labs across the world that are doing these large scale replication studies where they're actually pre registering, pre registering the replication beforehand, initial peer review, and then they're uh, actually carrying out the, uh, the replication with you know, sufficient power to actually detect the effect of interest. Um, Mini labs, too, these were sort of the first, um, first groups, but now there's these two on the bottom. Um, and then finally, uh, so you know, I think in machine learning, there's a website called like Open Review where you can. You know, get you can have the community reach out to you, um, and if you are missing their work citation, um, and sort of the peer review process is a bit transparent. So there's been a move to uh, bring into social sciences, allow scientists to sort of look at each other's work and critique it and the like, 
And so this is one website that's um, pretty popular um, that sort of does that. So, yeah. Yeah, so um, this is like a, a uh, example. So you would look at, uh, you would basically put your paper in um, and then really anyone can sort of, um, it's almost, I suppose, like a, a form. I, I suppose it's not really like a, a um, you know, a, a, you know, it's already been published in the journal, so there's not really a, uh, um, you know, it's not like it's going to not be there, but people can just sort of provide some, like, context, um, questions, maybe some speculation from other studies, and it allows, I think, others to kind of quickly catch up to speed with maybe some problems with the um, existing study. Yeah. Um, great. So, uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, you know, understanding, you know, wh where findings were, findings were replicated or retracted, uh, just being more transparent about the materials that you, um, you, uh, you know, that you have and you've, you've, you've uh, used to get this like huge, you know, this uh, high <laughs> sort of like interesting statistical effect uh, are important. Another kind of area that's sort of uncommon is fraud. And there's a few tests that obviously these aren't, um, you know, smoke and gun tests, but maybe provide some kind of quick flags for looking at fraud. Uh, one of these tests is the Grimm test. So it really works with uh, any sort of survey data where um, you might use a Likert scale or, um, you know, any kind of continuous metric and you basically report your means and samples in, in the abstract and it sort of allows you to uh, basically, you know, assuming that, you know, uh, the researchers report this mean and a Likert scale is, you know, between one to seven. Can we, can we actually expect that that's what you would recalculate based on what we know about the Likert scale? And, uh, and I, I encourage you to read this paper if you're interested. These are just really kind of like simple checks to make sure that a you know, finding is actually reporting um, what they reported that they had done. So again, um, David, I don't know if you want to comment on the Grimm test or not, but yeah. Um, great. Um, and then again, I'm not really surveying all the ways to detect fraudulent data. Um, some, some, some cases there's like image manipulation where you might do these sort of stimuli based studies and they might sort of forge, you know, um, they might sort of perturb the image in such a way. And, uh, and that doesn't really, that's not really on the press as, as much, but it actually ha has happened in the past. And, you know, there are sort of new um, approaches to deal with that, that can take some metadata from the image and kind of understand if, um, you know, if it has been, you know, uh, tampered with with a, a uh, you know, like Photoshop or what have you. Um, so another uh, kind of more so obvious <laughs> um, sort of way to look at, uh, you know, if there's sort of inconsistencies in data is to use this website called statcheck.io. So I was, I was actually going to show you guys a demo of it uh, for a few papers that I found, but there's actually a lot of, it's actually in beta right now. And, it, and honestly, I wouldn't, Recommended, but basically what it does is it takes a um, it takes the statistical test that you have and it sort of puts them into um, you know a Python or R statistical software and it recomputes the p values and just match try to see if what the author is putting in the paper matches what you know you can regenerate with the statistical software. So that's basically all it does. Um, but you know one can do that manually as well. So again, this isn't really a comprehensive overview of kind of fraud. Again, this isn't like Part of your homework as well, so um, I'm not really going to go into detail about too many methods, but um, just know that there are a lot of interesting methods that um, can potentially flag um, flag research that might have fraud, so might be fraudulent. Um, yeah. So, right. So, going on to the next um, next category. So, looking into sort of common um, sort of research, you know, uh, mis question research practices. Uh, and some ways to deal with those. So, um, you know, we're going to think about this sort of, we're going to talk about this area of pre registration. And then we're going to kind of get into power analysis, which Dave uh, introduced in the last class. But I just kind of wanted to make some more points about it. And then that will kind of set us up for the meta statistics um, uh, section, which is, I think, the most important section in this talk. So, pre registration. So, um, you know, a lot of there's been a lot of work trying to figure out okay, how after a publication has uh, you know 
kind of get discovered to a journal? What, you know, has, has there been fee hacking done? Um, and, you know, that's actually really difficult to do after the fact. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, interest in and really separating exploratory and confirmatory research um, as they sort of should be separated. Um, so, to, so that, you know, you're not kind of just, you know, in the example of the jelly beans, you're not just like running all these tests and then only reporting the one that, um, that was significant um, with this p-value less than 0.05. And so uh, this is what registration does. Uh, and so really, it's a high level, it's just this timestamp document. Um, it, you can't change it. Um, and you typically do this before data collection. Uh, and, but you can write these sort of amendments uh, um, after the fact. So you might pre-register at the beginning and then you write another pre-registration when you collect more data. Um, so you can sort of do it in a phasic sort of way, uh, but you know, typically done before the study. And then you submit it to uh, a few websites. So there's Open Science uh, Framework, which I mentioned before. There's AppsPredicted.org. Uh, so they make it really easy for you to pre-register your studies. Um, and these, these honestly, these benefits are somewhat kind of obvious, um, but this kind of comes from the open science framework community. Um, but I think the thing, the thing to, I guess, see here is that, um, you know, it kind of, you know, done right, it, it's sort of like a way for you to maybe pursue more ambitious kind of research questions in some ways, because you're really, you know, um, you're really kind of encouraged to explore um, and then and then test the finding um, after the fact. And so, uh, and, and the finding could be, you know, a no result, but at least, um, you know, people know that this is something that goes pressure. So there's like likely, you know, there's more transparency. Um, it deals with the file drawer problem that I mentioned before. Uh, and it deals with p-hacking. I can potentially deal with p-hacking. Um, so there's obviously some caveats. This is not like a silver bullet. Uh, people can sort of do registration after the results are known. Uh, so that's kind of a, something that's taken to consideration. Um, and notably, uh, there's some work on register reports where you actually, you do have initial peer review um, for pre-registration uh, and then you, you know, do the pre-registration at a later time point. Um, you, can, you, can, you can basically submit more, more pre-registrations, but essentially what you're doing is you're, you're kind of um, held accountable for that first pre-registration. So yeah, um, so Again, um, pre-registrations they can typically contain hypothesis. Um, you know, the variables you're going to manipulate. Um, you know, your analysis, the way you're going to calculate power, uh, and sort of what sort of tests you might run. Uh, and so, they, obviously, you know, you don't have to report exactly what you're going to do because uh, you might, you know, look foolish if you say that you're going to do this and then it's not going to um, hold. So you can kind of be somewhat big. But um, there's actually a website that I uh, I put here where I could I kind of show this later. I don't know if I can share it now, but this is here's some examples of pre registration. People can kind of like get a sense of what it's a great one. And um, yeah, uh, so I don't know if I, I guess I could do that a bit like maybe after I go through the slides, but uh, it can help maybe contextualize what's a good pre registration and how much detail you need to provide. Um, similarly, there are templates that one could use for different like different types of research um, studies. And so these are all in open science framework. And like I said before, there are many uh, resources to learn more about pre-registration. Uh, some I think a common caveat, people feel like it's sort of this uh, thing that you know you're stuck with. Um, but you know, you effectively can uh, you know make an amendment, um, but just you know, encourage that communication disclosure. And there's a lot of a lot of great resources that I'm kind of like just glossing over right now um, for the sake of time, but really would encourage you to look, look at these to understand because there's been a lot of research on pre-registration and it actually has affected the replication. Um, crisis in a significant way in terms of papers that, um, in terms of like reducing the amount of papers with, you know, these, um, you know, false positives or, you know, uh, significant results. Um, and yeah, a lot of great, great research there. So. I'll just take you to start the homework. We're asking people. Yeah, great, great point. Um, Great. So now um, let's kind of get into this sort of um, more, I guess, more practical method. So let's go into power analysis a bit. So, you know, David mentioned um, a bit about power in the first class. Um, and so you know, here we have like, uh, you know, our, 
you know, essentially like if, if our null hypothesis is true or not, um, or, and, you know, just taking from our statistical test, can we judge that, um, do we successfully reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject it? So, um, so when you're setting your alpha value, you are, um, you're kind of looking at this quantity, like assuming the null hypothesis is true, you know, um, P is less than 0.05, was five, there's a 5% 5 chance that I can kind of reject um, the null hypothesis. Um, and so, you know, power kind of lies in this, um, you know, power is sort of, you know, you know, this probability of false negative. Um, so really it's kind of, what's the probability that I reject the null hypothesis? Um, uh, you know, what's the probability, sorry, what's the probability of, um, Sort of yeah so I guess like assuming that there's a true effect um, kind of what's the what's the probability that actually sort of um, can reject this null hypothesis so so an example would be um, like you know for so example would be like uh, assuming that like uh, men and women have uh, average differences in height um, if I ran a statistical test um, what's the probability that I could actually detect that difference? Is that in, in you know, assuming 80% power, um, I can assume that that 80% uh, chance of sort of detecting a significant result when um, the effect is actually true. And there's a 20% chance running this test that, um, that I won't be able to detect that result. Um, and so you can see that it, it's, it's kind of really important quantity and it's based on your effect size, your sample size, and your alpha level. So what are some, um, yeah, what are some reasons why power is important to consider? So um, as I mentioned before, in the first case, um, you know, if I have 33% power, um, or, you know, if I have 40% power, and I kind of try to run this test of um, differences between men and women, which is, which is a true effect, um, you know, basically just saying that even if I run this test, there's a 60% chance that I won't, you know, find this true result. And you can see that like um, it really makes it hard to you know, understand if, you know, um, if sort of the test that you're running is actually, um, you know, useful or if the effect is actually real in that, in that sort of sense. So, um, so that's, that's, that's one of the problems. Uh, another problem is fairly interesting of, um, so I talked a bit before about this, but um, when you're when you're plotting distribution of effect size, so you're you're typically, um, so say Cohen's D is 0.5. Um, your power is not going to affect that mean, but it's going to affect the spread. And so the representation of that here is um, this first analysis. I have 30% power, and the spread is obviously you know, very wide. 90% power, narrow spread. Okay. So what what is kind of interesting about this? So this sort of means that if I have a significant effect size and only 30% power, that means that those findings that are significant have, are likely to just overshoot the actual power, um, you know, the actual effect size that, that, that kind of exists in my data. Um, and, you know, similarly 90% power, there's, it could be less, it could be a bit more, but at least the effect size of interest is able to be detected. So um, that's actually really problematic because um, you know, essentially, as David mentioned, this sort of like explains why one should kind of like calibrate their effect sizes um, when they're looking at previous literature because uh, there is some work on um, looking at the effect sizes or looking at the, um, the papers with significant results across the literature um, and of course, you know, psychiatry, psychology, there are a lot of significant results here and it's space science, air science, um, pure science, et cetera, you know, a different story. But, um, but what this means is that, um, for these studies in this bottom, uh, it, it, or, or, I guess in this bottom category over here, um, it's likely the case that there are many, um, findings that have inflated effect size. So you need to kind of um, likely change your sort of prior about the uh, size of the effect before you actually build on top of this kind of work. Um, and so 
that makes actually doing feature power analysis very difficult. Um, and so that's something that one, you know, kind of needs to sort of internalize when um, neglect to like doing a power analysis. Uh, similarly, uh, David mentioned this, um, you know, calculation of positive predictive value uh, in, the, in the last class. So, um, you know, you have your power, you have sort of the probability that you believe your hypothesis to be true. Um, and you can effectively, you know, in your alpha level, you can effectively calculate this, this, this value of interest, which is, um, you know, the, probably the, the actual results you have represent the positive. So the point, the point here is that, you know, if, if the effect is actually, so, so which is basically what you really care about, you know, the effect is real. So you can kind of plot the power at different, um, sort of different strata. And, um, you know, maybe you assume that probably hypothesis is not really true or probably the hypothesis is, is, is highly likely. You can still see that with low power, you can't really, you can't really gain much from um, that, even if your probability of your pre study odds of, of, of it being true are really high, you know? So this, I guess, um, false positive, it also affects false positive. So power analysis is super important. Um, and so really what I, I'm only doing here is that there are many references to how to calculate power online, but I just wanted to quickly, just what is the procedure of doing that? So um, we're basically looking at, um, in the case of like a t-test for instance, um, you know, we're gonna compute our effect size. We're gonna take our means, um, we need to set an alpha level, we need to set a power. Um, and so these are typically set to 0.05 and 0.8. Um, and it's almost kind of like a calculator, you know, I, I mean, there, you can actually simulate, you can actually simulate power as well. Um, but there are many sort of resources out there to calculate power. Um, this is just one quick example in Python using stats models. Um, so here, um, I don't know if people in Zoom can actually see me, so I can sort of like do this. Um, but, you know, here we're calculating our, um, here we're calculating our effect size using, um, you know, using, maybe using a Cohen's D. Uh, and then effectively, we have our alpha level, we have our power level. Um, we can, you know, and we can, we can effectively calculate um, the sort of, uh, yeah, we can calculate the sample that we need using, you know, just using this information. This is just in case of a t-test. Um, so fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, also, um, say you have a, observed a sample. Um, so um, you know, 40 in this case, you can go back and can kind of compute the power of that, assuming like effect size, um, alpha level, and um, you can just run this and, and compute it. What's even the most interesting to look at, because this kind of goes into the question we had last class about, you know, how do I choose my effect size? You can actually, um, you know, with this plot different effect sizes and you can kind of maybe get a sense of, you know, assuming a really small effect size is what I need, large effect size is what I, um, I need and kind of maybe calibrate your understanding to the to the um, sample that you wish to um, collect for this you know sample that you just gather for this sort of study. So this is a just a quick um, yeah. These are all fairly, fairly straightforward. So um, just wanted to also point out that G Power is a really popular tool. I have it downloaded on my computer right now, so I could do a quick demo if if that's of interest. But um, this is also just kind of what I generated before. So you can kind of see, um, and I'm just gonna to go to the screen, but basically you can kind of see, you can set the test family, um, physical test, and there are different types of power analyses that you can run. There's also post hoc power after you, you have your sample. Um, and then you just sort of specify the values of interest, effect size. If you don't know your effect size, you can just um, press this to determine and you can provide, provide um, the means, et cetera, for this particular test to determine the effect size. And then it's fairly, straightforward from there. They, they all kind of generate the same, same thing. So quick, um, yeah, just a quick uh, introduction to power analysis. I'm sure most of you have at least heard of it. And um, there's a lot of great work to, um, yeah, basically look into some more advanced ways to, to do power analysis. So there's another one on, um, on simulated power analyses, which I would consider you guys doing if you want to be more um, you want to sort of like think about your data generating process and then use um, power analysis tool on top of that. 
So, yeah, yeah, actually, uh, that's uh, yeah, probably a good idea. Oh, yeah. Um, do you guys have any questions about anything uh, that I said so far? Um, make sure oh, I see the chat. Okay. I think this is mainly Dave. So great. Also, how am I doing on time? I feel like I'm almost. <laughs> oh. Oh, half an hour. Okay, cool. Oh, great. Sweet. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I think there are many journals. Uh, there's PLO, PLOS um, Biology um, that's that's sort of like uh, looking for pre registrations when a person um, is seeking publication or journal. Um, there, I, I believe there's uh, there are many journals that are like taking into account register reports, which is sort of advanced form of pre registration um, for these like many lab studies. So there there is a lot of traction. Um, Right now, I think um, uh, I also don't know if you guys have any comments on that, but I know I know that in psychology it seems I, I noticed some of the other scientists, like I saw politi uh, I think political science, they had some pre-registration um, requirements, but psychology, I'm not quite sure if they're it's kind of like up to pace with. Yeah, so if you go to I think it's the And so you have to pre register as like one of two official. Basically, every journal will have a state how you pre register and what you do with. But um, not only do they have a list of different journals and how to do that process, uh, but they also have tips on how to recruit a journal that's not doing it versus going not. So it's a, it's a grassroots effort, but it's definitely, particularly with the journals that have seen the most negative press. For you know, failed replication attempts, a lot of them have started to adopt this philosophy. Uh, and uh, I can actually kind of like, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this was basically um, we're taking like basically samples of an effect size um, that was, you know, we're given we're sort of kind of you know it was a I guess the power calculation takes into account effect size, so you can effectively kind of generate um, effect size knowing power, right? Um, and so this is kind of just a simulation of like four hundred thousand, or well, actually not in this case. Uh, I have to count the the waxes but simulation of, of different effect sizes with that level of power and you can kind of yeah you can sort of see that um you can see that when you have sufficient power most of the effect sizes kind of are um kind of converged to the effect size that um that that you originally specified um uh, you know given that given that level of power so uh yeah i mean so it's it's kind of just showing you that there's value in uh, there's value in 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 sort of when you're trying to actually estimate the effect size given um, what's in your sample. Um, there's value in uh, having a really high powered sample in order to act really accurately get that effect size um, because there are many you know small sample n equals twenty studies where the effect size might be great but or really high um, but um, they might, they, they're not necessarily calibrated to the, the true effect size in the population if um, there's a more representative sample. Um, I don't know, David, you had any comments on that? Yeah, yeah so, so the power, right? The, power, the likelihood that you detect an effect is a function, like Noah was saying, of the sample, the effect size, 
and the number of samples that you're taking, right? So those are the two things that matter. And so the other thing is your alpha. And if you go back to that, those distributions, so if we, basically the idea, right, is if we assume we're keeping our alpha constant, we assume we're keeping our sample size constant in this plot, for a given power, like the other thing that's going to change, right, how, how, how certain we can be about going to. So there's this relationship between, like, sort of holding the other thing constant, power, and the distribution of that size, and like, how confident you can be so the, the big point here is that the lower the power, the more spread you can affect the effect in um, the effect size that you see given some true Yeah. Would it be helpful to see program? Okay. Let me do a new share. Um, I think, is this already up there? Okay. Well, yeah, I just have these, like this, I guess, calculator of like, um, oh, I just can't share over there. I guess I thought I would share to the Zoom. Uh, let me try this. Um, sorry, one second. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's kind of strange. I thought I share. They, they do see on Zoom, okay, but you don't see there, okay. Um, oh, okay, yeah, maybe I can go back to the screen then or screen two, you said, and then drag actually. I think the easiest thing to do is just share my screen and then go to the desktop and yeah, is that okay? Maybe not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay, cool. Let's try this. Uh, Ah, uh, geez, why am I having so much trouble? I'm just gonna, um, I'm just gonna reshare and then um, just see. People on Zoom can see it, but you guys still can't see it. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. I just moved it. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think they can still, they're not seeing it anymore. No, we're not seeing that. We're not seeing the second. Okay, you are okay, great. Um, yeah, so I can kind of like, um, yeah, so you're saying like, uh, Matt, changing like the effect size and sort of seeing the, um, yeah, I guess like, so yeah, we could effectively increase the power to sort of see how it would. Maybe we just played around with a couple different. Uh, 30. Okay, effect size is 0.3. Okay, yeah. Wait, wait, okay. So now I have to like go to the bottom, which, ah, uh, geez, why am I, okay. Troubleshooting real time, uh, just trying to see. Okay, let's, let's just do this, guys. Okay, this does look in, okay, great. Okay, I'm just trying to pull this up so I can calculate. Okay, yeah, so this is 80%. So this looked pretty similar to what we had seen before. Um, and it also provides us with, I can't even see it on the screen, but it provides us with a sample size. Um, on the right, it says total sample size. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 so, so great, so, so um, yeah, so typically, yeah, so you, you, like I said before, you require effect size and alpha level and power to get sample size. Calculation is um, 
and deterministic. So effectively, like um, you can just change um, one input and get everything else. Um, and yeah, I mean, um, like I think I was saying before, jeez, um, can't seem to. Uh, that's okay. You can you can kind of choose your um, you can choose your effect size if you typically know the means. In this case, it's like a two sample test. Um, but you know, there are obviously other types of power analyses when you're given another um, another quantity. So uh, you already have your sample size. And you can kind of compute your power. Um, but yeah, just going maybe back to this one more time. Okay, yeah. I think you should be able to kind of detect that separation a lot, a lot better. Um, so you'll just go to point two power. Um, you know, look kind of low ability to detect this true effect. Um, and when you, yeah, when you increase the power, you to 0.99, you can, given this effect size, which is, I guess, a bit small. So like if we went to 0.8, um, you can see this uh, factor separation. Let me just point to, oh, geez. yeah. I, uh, okay, yeah. I mean, it obviously still, still doesn't really matter. Um, yeah. 10. So um, I don't think that's a valid. Okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, I, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's really large effect size. It's, it's probably, I don't know, um, an obvious kind of, yeah, an obvious sort of effect. Um, yeah. Anyways, I, I, um, I don't know if this is like just kind of redundant um but yeah but i mean I'll, i guess all this is is just showing here is given a test you know it, it's kind of straightforward i guess in terms of what to compute um for me the thing i always feel like i have in my mind when i'm looking at this is these are distributions of that test distance that you have to compute the power of and one the one on the center of zero is always the test statistic you would expect and then the one on the right is you have to assume that there's an effect size and a certain number of things, you know, and we'll get the sort of distribution. Of and then we can reason about, you know, if you draw a cutoff line here, you know, how much area is there on each side in, in for each one of those three hypothetical worlds where there's no effect or there's an effect that we can know. And so if we draw this line and we say, like, we got a result, if it goes on that type of line, we accept it. If it comes back on this other line, we don't accept it. Mm -hmm. Are we going like how confident can we be that we caught a real effect, you know, on that side of the line versus sort of like didn't catch a real effect on this side? So it's just kind of like about the way we're fixing the area of these probability distributions of the test statistic across and back in relation to this one line that was sort of arbitrarily drawn, right? Basically, you have this slight between false and positive, false and negative. And it's like, okay, which one do I want to like lean on? So by basically increasing your power, uh, that fight is like a dramatic increase. There's always a chance of like uh, versus um, Sorry, I'm like, but... Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think we heard any of that. Um, also, I see three questions in the chat. Okay. Oh, no, you're okay. Oh, these are you. These are all you. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I also, also just appreciate that um, and diversion. Um, yeah. Um, great. So, right. So, okay. Um, let's just go to this last 
question that maybe we can go back to, or area that maybe we can go back and kind of revisit some of these. But this area is um, kind of one that uh, is still a bit like when I, when I present you, just I guess don't. I'm going to kind of give the intuition, but notice there's also a lot of complexity in it. Um, and, you know, there isn't really, you know, in the same way that people use different meta analyses, estimates, uh, meta statistics is still kind of a sort of, um, there's no silver bullet <laughs> at the moment. But I want to just present um, everyone with this paper that kind of like um, made waves and um, the psychology uh, community, but also many other economics and other social sciences and the stats literature as well, uh, called the P curve, the file drawer. And so these were the same authors that kind of outlined these initial methods um, before around, um, you know, what are some common question research practice? And they noticed that P hacking wasn't something that um, there was really a great way of dealing with. Granted, that's not completely true because, you know, we, can, we use, we do meta-analysis, so there are a lot of ways to look at that. But, um, but they sort of thought about, okay, you know, let's just kind of focus on this distribution of p-values uh, because it seems like that, that, are, that are significant because it seems that uh, the psychologists that are p-hacking, they're trying to get right below this threshold, 0 0.04, 0 0.03. Um, and does the, does the distribution take on a particular characteristic when there's a true effect? And can we kind of quantify the evidential value of p-hacking? So, um, we know in psychology, um, I showed you before, there's that, uh, there's that diagram of all the significant results. So um, tests are more likely to be published when they're statistically significant. Um, and, so, and so what's interesting is that uh, these authors kind of developed this metric, which can give some context of the kind of evidential value of literature, not, not necessarily you know, saying that this, this literature didn't p hack, but it's 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 less plausible given um, high evidential value. Um, but I'll, I'll make a kind of a caveat here is that I I think this is most useful when um, you're kind of looking at p p curves that lack evidential value, and you can kind of clearly see that than ones that match um, what you're expecting. But I'll kind of describe a bit more to. Uh, so you can understand what I mean. So um, like I said before, they, they're only looking at um, p values that are significant. So point, uh, less than 0.05. And so this is what they assume. So they assume that assuming, um, so kind of under the null hypothesis, the, this is the distribution of p values. So this is what the distribution of p values should take. Um, so this uniform distribution of p values. Um, but when there's a, an effect, and this is actually with very low power, so only 15%, you can still see this sort of you know, your right skew where there's higher likelihood of finding these, um, these statistically significant values, p values that are um, kind of closer to, point, closer to zero than there are you know, closer to 0.05. And when you increase the power, you start to notice that this curve um, becomes more and more right skewed. Uh, and the interesting thing is that even with 46% power, almost two times as many p-values, you know, are kind of in this less than 0.02 kind of category. So this, this result kind of motivates kind of intuitively why one would want to check um, to see if this distribution holds um, given a set of uh, research studies like elderly priming, where maybe the, re the researchers kind of like saw, try to do... Um, do p hacking where they're running all these comparisons and taking out samples and the like. Um, so this is kind of what what you, what you can find in that with, with that kind of given example. So where um, they they basically simulated four hundred thousand um, four hundred thousand kind of studies and they sort of did a stop optimal stopping rule where once the p value was less than 0.05, um, um, once what you know stop stop the kind of like um, Stop adding kind of more um, more samples, uh, and this is kind of what sort of they found when, when they did that. Uh, and so that result might not be super um, super interesting 
to everyone. But my favorite result is kind of this one where they took a psychology journal where many of the studies they suspected were p-hacked. So they had done these comparisons. So, so basically they had all these, uh, you know, cross, cross analyses where they're looking at this covariate, how it affected, um, you know, what, what were the, the mean difference was based on this covariate or that covariate. And there's a lot of like context that kind of goes into the physical, um, basically the, the effect. And so all these studies here, um, they had this kind of like additional covariate that they had to incorporate in order to find this effect. And when they looked at all of those journals, they found the P curve was what one would expect um, if, if there was P hacking, where there are a lot more P values that are um, less than 0.04 or 0.05. And you know, where you're getting a sense of this literature might have um, lack of evidential value. So they provide these two tests where you're looking at, um, you're basically trying to see if uh, you're comparing against this null and you're comparing against. Um, in this, this rise skew p value, or the, the p value of um, p value that you actually observe. Um, and you're really trying to see, and, and so what they do is they um, compute a, uh, what they call in paper, a, like a pp value where they take the p values and then they divide it by 0.05. So that's like, that's, that's kind of um, showing, basically creating this, um, assuming this kind of null is true. Um, this is what you would, uh, this is what they're first doing to kind of get this get this value because um, that's what they're comparing against, and then they conduct an F test, uh, which again I'm not really describing this that deeply because I I think I wanted to mainly just sort of motivate the intuition and the details in the paper. Um, would I be happy to discuss maybe a later point? But um, but but there there's some interesting um, there's some interesting kind of like you know, kind of sentence to this and. Um, it, it's actually got a lot of traction in the stats community as well. Um, so that's one of the tests. The second test is, so say I create a p-curve and I only have four or five p-value, three p-values. Can I really detect um, you know, an effect from this literature even though I don't have sufficient power to test that? So they basically, instead of, they replace this null effect with a effect of 33% power, um, which uh, again, um, there's like some motivation in the literature with some simulations why they chose that value, but um, they use that to kind of get a sense of, um, can we actually detect anything interesting at all, given what was kind of you know, put into the p-curve. So um, these are kind of the two common tests and I, uh, and, and, and essentially like there's, there's some other kind of, there's a lot, there's a lot of motivation behind it, but uh, this is kind of what you would get when you run a p-curve using um, yeah, using kind of their app that they created. created. So this is uh, kind of the website, pcurve.com. They have an online app where um, you kind of run these tests and kind of get this insight. Get, get sort of, run, they'll run kind of the two tests on your on the p values that you, that you um, provide. And we also have um, a user guide, which I'll describe a bit more about because it's actually really important. Um, in terms of what hypotheses you include when you're running kind of p-curve analysis. Uh, yeah, so let me just, yeah, so uh, the p-curve app, this is, you know, what you'll see, you'll see uh, um, a set of statistics where you can, that you, that you like, you look at a hypothesis of interest and, and then you kind of find, okay, in this set of literature, what are, where are all the, uh, you know, where are all of the results that uh, are sort of designed to support this hypothesis? Um, where is all the evidence for this particular hypothesis? And you report all these values. It will compute the p-values, it will compute the pp values, um, and then you can run both statistical tests um, to get the p-curve, and you'll get a p-curve as well. So, um, so I know that was kind of very, probably uh, maybe a bit like, Cryptic, um, but I, I also, I can, I can kind of choose to motivate the intuition. I could also, sorry, I could choose to like describe it more about it, or I could also just describe some of the, um, some of the, I guess the, the guide first to kind of describe like what the approach would be um, a bit more. If, well, okay, I'll, I'll start with that. So, so yeah, so yeah, so yeah, basically this is kind of like, 
Yeah, yeah that's, that's the whole reason why I'm going to go into it. But anyways, um, so really what, yeah, what you want to do first is you want to look into, um, you want to first kind of pre-specify kind of a rule that you're using to, before you generate this P curve. Um, this could be like looking at, you know, elderly priming work, um, um, you know, evidence for elderly priming, evidence for money priming, et cetera, or like um, evidence for the facial feedback hypothesis. Um, and so this is what you're going to specify first. And then I keep forgetting this click thing. Um, yeah, why is it not advancing? Okay. Step two, you're going to create this um, disclosure table. And so there's an example, um, there's an example in the user guide. I omitted it here um, because it's kind of it has like many hypotheses, but the basic steps are, you know, you're trying to make it really clear what p values went into the analysis. Um, and you know, you're gonna identify the results, you're gonna quote it from the paper, you're going to recompute the p value. And this step five is about robustness results. So there is a another p curve. Um, um, so basically what what this is is that there was some work on okay, so assuming that so the p the p curve is kind of designed to look for p hacking, but there's also the case of ambitious p hacking where someone's, you know, maybe um, they have a p-value less than 0.025 and they're trying to kind of really p-hack to kind of get to that result. So there are some other additional tests like a half curve where you're just looking from zero to 0 0.025 and you, you need your p-values, I think, to, um, for these sort of robustness checks, you need to kind of um, report results of um, other, I guess, analysis that were related um, to, um, kind of add a sense of, get a sense of like how robust are your, your findings. That's, I mean, I, I think there was also some, I don't know if you um, had read that too, right, where there was some half curve sort of analysis or, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, well, um, anyways, yeah. So this is just something, this would be a bit more clear with the user guide. So I'll just, um, yeah, I'll just kind of move on for now. Um, and so uh, one thing that was mentioned here is that, it's up to identify the result testing state hypothesis using table three. So this is table three. Uh, and so here are some kind of common um, research designs. And they were basically saying here is that, so assuming um, that the research is about attenuation, which is, you know, we have a control value, we have like a, we have this sort of a variable where we're modulating it and you're saying kind of, you know, um, you're saying people will, well, you're saying the dependent variable will be modulated by a particular variable. You want to make sure to not report the main main result, which you get from an ANOVA, or report the interaction where you're actually looking at the result, the exposure, and the, um, you know, and, and kind of the condition that you're using. And better examples, I think, in the user guide, but this is just a really important point that they note. Um, and then in this case, they're looking for, um, you know, they, they're also mentioning that there are some reversal designs where you're, um, you know, you're, you're, you're really, really going to pay attention to like where it says um, this is not the case. Um, and so you're just reporting the, um, you're just reporting kind of the worst performance results when, um, so you can kind of like see that there, but um, you're just reporting these results when you're kind of looking at the reversal. Uh, so anyways, uh, um, yeah, so there's some more examples there, but one thing I wanna to mention too is P-curve um, can't be used for discrete tests. So, you know, chi-square test, F-test, where you have integer values, um, and you're looking for differences there. So that's just something to note. Um, and, uh, and so there's also some um, R packages, which can also compute P-curves, but they also take into account um, like the heterogeneity of the um, you know, sort of, of, of the effects um, in analysis, which there's been some work on trying to kind of um, examine how that actually impacts the p-value. So I think um, we can also maybe post this link in the homework too, to kind of, uh, if you're interested in looking at heterogeneity first before you put the p-values in, I think this is like an important point that um, kind of shouldn't be glossed over, but yeah, let me, uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, let's say I'm having a 
Yeah. Mm. How else is it? Is it here you can talk about two by two designs? Is it just in your like, reception or like where does that work? Yeah. Um so I think the first thing is like, what is the question that is being asked? Um, and what are they testing? What's the main you know, um, kind of contribution of the paper? Uh, and then you're really just looking at the results section to examine, okay, this question, this hypothesis that they say in their introduction, where is this test that's showing that their hypothesis is likely to be true? Um, and you wanna make sure to just not include anything that's spurious or unrelated to that specific question. Um, and there's actually a reason for that. There was a, Amy Cuddy had done a peak curve analysis, you know, the power pose sort of work. And, um, and, there, and it was a bit dubious, like which studies she included to get the peak curve to take on a particular form. So it's really, really important to kind of make sure that you're, um, you know, looking for these, these clear kind of treatment versus control. Um, um, I'm, I'm sort of, um, yeah, test statistics. Um, and making sure to be explicit what you're actually, what peak curve is actually representing um, there. So, yeah. And this just kind of gives you a sense when you actually do have a design to kind of what to look for. There's actually another example of paper that actually is, explains it a bit better than, um, than this diagram. Um, so if this sounds a bit confusing, um, I will like make sure to send an email with the, with the information, maybe like put a blurb there to kind of reemphasize what to be looking for. Um, when you're doing your peak curve analysis. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so yeah, so you can like look typically look at, you know, we're really trying to find like an association between um, I don't know, um, I'm thinking of like an obvious thing like lung smoking and lung cancer. <laughs> and uh, there is like uh, there is like an effect size that you're getting from that um, and regression analysis and your, um, it does say like there's a, you know, in the first case, like you're doing like a, a linear trend. So here they're looking at how does math training affect um, math performance. So they're looking for that kind of linear uh, regression kind of trend. And, you know, you can, you can get a p-value from, um, yeah, from that test um, as well to incorporate in the analysis. But, um, but yeah, um, so yeah, just, just I guess the, the tests that you don't wanna do are these sort of discrete statistics tests. Um, you don't wanna kind of, you don't wanna sort of like we're comparing these proportions, like, um, I don't know, Matt, do you have any thoughts on, on this point on discrete tests? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so yeah, um, and what I mentioned here around heterogeneity, um, yeah, this, oh, huh? Yeah, so this is like, um, you're gonna get these effect sizes um, in your, um, your p-values. Um, and really, uh, you might have p-values with a lot of different effect sizes, right? Um, and so if there's high heterogeneity, which you can calculate with, um, there's a feature in, in R that calculates this heterogeneity estimate. Um, and there's a basically a warning here. I wanna see if I can pull this up actually. Um, but there's a warning if your P-curve is, has a, uh, geez, a heterogeneity above um, 0 0.5, then you should, um, you should kind of be cautious about the results. And typically what to do is like to remove, to try to remove outliers in order to, um, yeah, in order to like um, prevent against you know, there's high heterogeneity, but uh, I actually can't click on a link, which is kind of, I could sort of paste it in a, another window, but I also don't know if it's worth the time. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm almost kind of toward the end here. So I mean, the last step is just you want to report all the output um, on the paper. Um, and yeah, and then I think mainly wanted to mention some problems with P-curve analyses. Like I just said, the heterogeneity of effect sizes, um, 
you know, there's still some ongoing literature in terms of what to interpret, um, you know, and how, to, how to best interpret the p-curve when there is this, uh, you kind of see this, uh, like I said before, discrete data. One area of interest is sort of like, okay, so say you get a right skewed p-curve and you say, okay, my literature has evidential value. This set of literature has evidential value. Well, how much evidential value does it have? Does it have a lot, you know, a little bit? That's the, kind of the effect sizes you're going to generate from this p-curve. And you can do that, but um, that's kind of where I think some of the stuff kind of falls off a bit. So there's been a, some work on um, kind of what happens when you collapse the power of many different studies. Um, and um, it basically requires a lot of studies in order to kind of get a really calibrated sense of power. And I can imagine that when you guys are doing this, if you're going from like 30 studies or 20 studies, then um, the power estimates are going to be um, flawed in some sense. So there's a paper which I can also link in the blurb um, that kind of motivates this a bit more. But when you're trying to actually es estimate the effect size, the best thing to do is to just run multiple meta analyses, uh, meta analyses, the effect size kind of methods, and on um, on like a set of um, I guess on the on the findings in the literature, the test in the literature, and you can really get a better sense of what's the what might be the actual effect size or get some bounds on the effect size. So that's just something to mention. Um, and then finally, this disclosure form which you guys are going to write is really important, um, which um, to, to kind of do to make sure that it's that the the hypothesis you're looking at are, are consistent with one another. Um, and just wanted to kind of harp on the effect size thing one more time. So there's this book, um, doing meta-analysis is an R, and it basically gives a better overview of the p-curve um, if you have like a lot of questions about it, um, but also other effect size estimates like hedges G, um, and, and Dave mentioned funnel plots, and there's a trim and fill method to kind of get an effect size from that. Uh, and so I really highly encourage you guys read this um, before you do your homework um, to kind of get a better sense of one, how p-curves might, might work, but also sort of um, what are some other ways to get effect size if I want to kind of characterize the evidential value. Um, and then I'm sure there are some ports from R to, to Python or what have you, but that's, if I find something that I'll, I'll let you know, but this is something, it's a really interesting um, review. Uh, yeah, so. Oh. You're using the term evidential value. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, basically, you know, what the common misconception of P curve is that, you know, it detects if P hacking kind of has occurred. Um, and really, given that, you know, um, like I think Dave mentioned, there's Cardinal Sin is kind of having these, um, having these sort of like, you know, it, it's true or it's not true. Uh, effect is real, it's not real. I think, um, I think evidential value kind of corresponds to given the data that we have um, access to this, we're only talking about the data itself. What does, you know, is, is it likely that this hypothesis test um, has high evidential value corresponding to this, um, to this, to the, the curve that we should expect? Um, and, and so I think it's more so used to deal with um, that distinction, but um, I, I also, there might be some, um, Something that I also could kind of miss there. But what do you? Yeah, well, so I was just like the on the P curve page that we're disclosing, right? Because it's the first P curve you can It's interesting. I think it's really interesting. A lot of these techniques, right, are very numerical. People are running a bunch of simulations and then we'll produce results and then that will be sufficient to kind of when the plot looks a certain way, we can infer some kind of value. The caution with Yeah, well, I will say there there is a there is a test that does detect like 
if the studies are underpowered, um, can we draw much from this analysis at all? That's the second test that you guys will generate. Um, um, it's, um, I think it's the test. So there's like two evidential value <laughs> questions yeah, in the paper. Yeah, 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 let's do that. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna do a new screen share then real quick. Um, yeah, let's. Yeah. Yeah, but this this paper is a really approachable like tool that you can draw in terms of like drawing plots that would be intuitive to inform your intuition and walking you through pretty explicitly how you can interpret some of these things. So the first step for the homework really is gonna be like read through the Yeah and just kind of like use your best to internalize what they're saying and don't skip on that part. <laughs> Oh, sorry, that's it's not. Yeah, so here we go. We, we can generate a P curve. Um, well, yeah, this is, um, I should say, the proportion test, not necessarily the tactical test. But, anyways, um, so yeah, this is what you should get when you, so yeah, it's called a, um, it's called a continuous test. Um, so yeah, oh sorry, this is the, the question that it's getting at. So studies of interest value, if if it is adequate, if it's inadequate, I guess. So um so this is kind of gets at the point where um we're assuming if we're assuming 33% power, what, what the curve should look like. Um if it's flatter than that, then maybe you don't have enough values kind of in your analysis. Um but yeah, I, I guess one one thing. Oh sorry. Yeah. We're drawing a line like that down the middle here of at 0.025. And we're just literally counting how many of our and how many of our And basically looking at that as our test of did this skew the way that we want it to skew the score. Like that's that's our sort of test of, yeah. of the Yeah, yeah, we are of the binomial. Yeah. So we're the first the first one. Um and again, there's a full P curve and there's a half P curve. So this is like getting at people are doing ambitious P hacking where they're assuming that it's 0 0.025. But um, we're gonna first, if it's 0 0.05, we're gonna first take our P values. We're gonna divide them by 0 0.05 um, to get these P P value, and then which is is the is is the value under the null here, um, and that's and that's gonna be again used to test this. Right, um, test this first question if there contains any additional value. Um, but we're not going to use that 0 0.05 when we're looking for um, this 33% power. Um, second question, I guess, because um, we're, we're, yeah, we're, here we're just trying to see if it's higher than this 33% power. So in the first test, you're comparing against this. Second test, you're comparing against this 33% um, power curve. Um, and, and so, yeah, so, so basically, here, I think the interpretation, if I scroll down, um, geez, I'm a, okay, here we go. Kind of weird because it's like to, um, uh, do they even have the, okay. Oh, so yeah, right there. So anyways, um, so yeah, in this case, both both of the tests, um, yeah, both the tests are met, yeah, indicating the potential value, um, yeah, the P curves, and then it tries to provide you with statistical power estimate, which again, I, I think you guys should take with a grain of salt, because um, it's it's just one power test out of out of others, I mean, out of many. But again, yeah, I think I encourage read the paper for for more details. Um, and again, the the R, um, yeah, sort of the 
our uh, the analysis of the R sort of like uh, documentation as well. Um, so that's, yeah, I mean, I also just want to do a quick evidence priming uh, P curve. Um, oh, I think this is eight only. Yeah, it does seem low, but yeah, this is eight studies. Yeah, in the P curve paper, they actually walk through how reliable this analysis is. Yeah. Also, did you want to talk about? No, oh, we could we could like also think about other tests like funnel plot, z curve, um, other ways that you can maybe show this with some additional um, additional. There are other statistics um, as well, and just having more um, kind of paints a better picture of because there are you know obviously a lot of assumptions that go into this. Um, if you try other ones and you're getting the same same finding, then it might be interesting to you know kind of just corroborate. Um, the narrative a bit more. So there's something called a Z curve. Um, it basically converts the p-values to a normal distribution. Um, and then you're also looking at uh, statistically insignificant results. I didn't explain this that well, but there is um there is some there's some like great um, work on the website um, that kind of talks about this other method. But I would if if you kind of want to go above and beyond, I think it'd be great to not just compute a p-curve, but explore some of these other meta-analyses for computing the average effect size and also um and then also compute like a z-curve a funnel plot um, um which are other things that you might have to we can provide some resources um but it would be again just above the maybe what you would originally do in the analysis so, um yeah i just wanted to quickly um just to, uh yeah, I'm sorry, elderly priming here to just give you guys an example of kind of what you, um, you know, p-hacking kind of would look like. So this is just, um, I guess see how many studies they included here, but this is the, um, this is kind of just a clear case of of something. Well, okay, and now I'm going to take out of this thing, but um, this, is, this is here like where something that, you know, if you see this and you're, um, after getting your, um, <laughs> You know, all these studies, then um, I think this kind of stands out as something that maybe should not be built off of. Maybe you don't want to make the inter interpretation that this finding doesn't exist, you know, this uh, effect doesn't exist, but maybe just the decision to figure out what to build off of and what not to build off of this kind of provides some way of, um, or provides a, 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 one, one, one of many ways to maybe explore, um, to help answer that question. Um, so I just wanted to. The uh, y axis is, it should be the, um, yeah, it looks like it's the um, number of studies. Yeah, number of studies. So the number of studies with p values of closer to 0 0.05 or really high. So I'm just bumps down. Yeah. But um, yeah, but and then notably, one other interesting thing is that Professor Priming, um, this is a p-curve, um, uh, maybe actually there isn't like a report on here around it, but uh, it, 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 you know, I could kind of, okay, so this is the p-curve for Professor Priming. Um, interestingly, so I believe it's if you, um, yeah, I think if you, it has to do with like something increasing your attention or acuity if you're primed about being a professor. I, honestly, I need to yeah, explore that a bit more. Okay, well, 
Okay, okay. Yeah, well, maybe, um, I don't know if this is, um, yeah. Um, sorry, yeah, I guess, um, okay, yeah, it seems like all these kind of, I also don't know if I should take too much time on this, but. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, let's just, okay, great. Great, but yeah, um, one thing I want to mention is that professor priming, you see the p-curve is showing this right skew. There's like a, there's like a divot there, um, but um, which would indicate that, okay, maybe you want to build off of this kind of work, but um, there was a recent replica. So this was actually a finding that was among the last priming studies that, um, you know, everyone was like, okay, this actually, this effect is, is real. Like, you know, stop, you know, bantering about priming. Um, this was like the last uh, priming study to replicate, I mean, to you know, have uh, funding for replication. And they actually replicated it recently. And it turns out that even though the P curve is, um, which I guess doesn't, it does include like, quite a bit size, but there's actually, uh, there was a replication attempt that was done that I think showed that um, there wasn't really strong evidence for professor priming. So, I only say that because the story is a bit more complex than just running something and and expecting that to get an answer. Um, it does require like careful interpretation and it does require like being like running multiple types of meta statistics to really not just like okay does it have evidential value but how much evidential value does it actually have, which is something that I would encourage you all to do for the assignment so you can actually see, um, yeah, so you can actually kind of get a better sense of if the fact you're finding or are interesting to build upon or not. Um, so. Yeah, is okay. Imagining that you're a professor. Yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and then. So the last of this curve was skewed to the left, whereas this curve was skewed to the right, given that. Yeah, I, I want to like, I I only chose this because this is something that I just saw almost yesterday, and um, um, I oh sorry, sorry. Okay, anyways, I I I, I think there is like a um, yeah. Did, did you talk about that in the replication uh, attempt? But I oh okay. Um, yeah, I think I just I mainly wanted to just show this show this first. I think, um, I mean this you know a lot of this research was done like fairly like long time ago. I think they were using some of these studies for the um, you know for the P curve. Um, and I and and to be fair, it it, it wasn't um, obvious to kind of why this wouldn't be effective in I think the meta analysis. And the effect sizes were, were really small, but I guess it does go to the point that Dave kind of emphasizes around classic or um, categorical thinking, um, um, sort of not being able to really, um, yeah, make it make. Yeah, actually, I, I need to probably think a bit more on this, but I, I do, um, yeah, I, that that's kind of why. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is that kind of related to your point earlier, I think that when you start to see this kind of clear left skew, it's a bit more easier to kind of like um, understand what to build off of than when you see this right skew. Because even I think Amy Cuddy has done some work, I mean, has, has done a recent pre-curve and she did find that this right skew, if you can incorporate studies, which we later found that she was using studies in her analysis that were like um, testing against obvious effects. So basically not, not power posing versus like normal posture, but like power posing versus like slouching or just doing, you know, not having really good control, I guess. And so I think it does go into like, what are you incorporating into your P curve analysis? Um, I haven't like done the due diligence of like, what's the trade off there or what's, why, why is it so different? But I, I can definitely um, come back to that question. I think kind of closer to the end of class. Yeah. Thank you. 
So what about let's just let's say we're trying to really share it for all these people. Like maybe we're trying to catch it. What could be a potential reason that you have to speak to the right, uh, but they weren't necessarily I want to stop. Yeah, that's that's really ambitious. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, this is kind of also from. I mean, there's there's an underlying assumptions going into this model um, as well, and um, I think they based off the peaker based on some empirical evidence. But this wasn't like it's not like I don't think they're doing maximum likelihood underneath to kind of you know before you're doing this kind of test. So there are some there could be some problems with the method itself too. Um, that that I think some other some other discussion around. There's actually a great paper which I, I really want to like maybe just put in the chat uh, on average power, and um, it kind of gets at some of these reasons why people can find different p curves based on um, yeah based on like how many, for instance, studies you have um, and and the type of studies that you have. So one one thing that's interesting is that the point estimate um, for the effect size is kind of intertwined with the interval. So there was some work with Amy Cuddy and um, basically they, these guys kind of found this sort of p-curve with Amy Cuddy's research in power posing um, with 30 studies, but Amy Cuddy reanalyzed it with, uh, she added 20 additional studies and she found like a low, you know, the kind of almost the opposite uh, kind of trajectory. Um, and the interval was, the interval is wider. So the interval in the first case, in terms of the effect size, was low. The interval is wider in the in the case where um, there were more studies. And so um, it's almost like there's some dependence between. And they actually did a reanalysis of this data, and I think they saw that there's actually some dependence between the interval size and the point estimate when you're talking about the average effect size. So um, that's all to say that like this, that when you're interpreting the effect size from it, um, just take some caution. Um, and look at other meta stats. Um, but that's actually a great point because I, and one that I think we could maybe talk a bit more at the end of the class once we've gone through some of the other talks. Um, like, kind of how do you, um, you know, how, how can you kind of even be wrong when you're doing everything right, it seems like, um, or not everything right, but yeah, when you're making, taking, making sure that it take uh, all these precautions. So, um, yeah. We were also returning to that like when we were, like share the paper and like you guys read on the peak curve analysis and maybe you have a different like answer then so yeah um any questions from zoom uh well, i guess like it's like everyone i think yeah okay sounds good okay we're good okay yeah where are we at oh we're at 535 okay cool um so i can stop sharing and then um, yeah, I don't know if you want to uh, have any comments, uh, dude. Or...